Find me on Twitter. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And um, if you've gone to high ed web before, um, you may have seen me in the past 10 years as a presenter or as a volunteer. This is the first of three shameless plugs for high ed web, uh, which is in October in Milwaukee. Um, Again, I was a programmer, a multimedia specialist. I worked on a UX team where I did interaction design alongside an accessibility consultant, which was very useful and informed a lot of the work that I've done. I've been an educator. One of the things that, um, that I found in uh, doing tech training is that you learn a lot about the user experience through tech training, and I did a little bit of that. Um, I've worked with WordPress, I've worked with Drupal, I worked with Adobe CQ before Adobe bought it, back when it was Date Communique. Actually, that was my trainer experience and my first experience with a block editor. And it also taught me about user frustrations and what we can do about them. I primarily work with instructional content. The bulk of my Penn State career has been with Penn State World Campus, which does a lot of the work for the online courses that Penn State offers. And we, we have a number of undergraduate, graduate, and certificate programs that are completely online. And then my current workplace is the College of Arts and Architecture for, for their online portfolio and trying to meet the needs of arts courses online. So I care a lot about how interactive content is offered since the online space is the only classroom that some of our students might see. Um, and personally, I'm a mom, I'm a jewelry maker, and I'm obsessed with all things time travel. So this is my Chrono Cross tattoo from the 90s <laughs> uh, because I'm that nerdy about time travel, and that's going to come to play later in the presentation. I also come with a PG-13 rating. When I did a gaming talk, it was T for Teen, but I, I just want to warn you that um, professionally, I'm a PG-13, uh, mild to moderate language, some adult themes, uh, so I'm assuming a mature audience. If that's not your thing, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you walk out. Um, but there might be some awkward, embarrassing questions and, and adult topics. For instance, you know, we're all grown-ups here. Sometimes you might get a question like, where does content come from? And now we're not naive. We know that content doesn't drop from the sky. So let's sit down and have the talk about content. You see... When a content author and an authoring interface love each other very much, they make beautiful content together. And we see that the author, that's the unique experience, the relationship that your content author and the authoring interface have. That authoring interface through the years has been the WYSIWYG editor. So again, time travel geek, we are going to do a little bit of some time travel to the wibbly wobbly world of the WYSIWYG editor. I can't believe I said that without tripping up. Awesome. There you go. So we're WordPress people here. And so this WYSIWYG editor should be very familiar to all of you. Do we know its name? Tiny MCE. Tiny MCE. Or classic, you might know it as classic, but it is Tiny MCE. And it has been around since 2004. I actually have a son who was born in 2005. He's my youngest child. He'll be a high school freshman. So Tiny MCE is older than my uh, teenage boy. Uh, how about this one? Anybody familiar with this editor? This, this is CK Editor. I thought I heard somebody say that in the back. Um, CK Editor has been around since 2003. My older child, my daughter, is uh, also born in 2003. Two days ago, she got her learner's permit because she turned 16. Um, so this one's pretty old as well. And before we had those, the way we published online was with Dreamweaver. Nice. Uh, 1997. How many people remember using Dreamweaver? Ooh, we have a lot. All right, and before Dreamweaver, the one that I first, the first WYSIWYG I used was FrontPage. Now I learned on Notepad, but FrontPage came out when I was in college. And so I, that was my first experience with a WYSIWYG for the web. But we all know FrontPage really just looks like MS Word, circa 1990. Now, 
The reason I bring up MS Word is MS Word wasn't designed for web content. It was designed for printing content. And so that WYSIWYG interface that we're using for the web was actually based on something we're doing in print. I used it on my first PC in high school. Um, anybody here born after MS Word? I could be your mom. <laughs> um, that's kind of sad, but what's even sadder than that is that this, this was the original WYSIWYG editor. Mac Wright. Almost 35, well, actually it is 35 years old now. Um, I like time travel and I like tech because living in tech in the last 40 plus years of my life, technology has changed so drastically, it's been like being in time travel. And, and yet, the WYSIWYG editor is the one thing that hasn't changed throughout time and space. The web is changing rapidly, and, uh, and we're still using something that was really just Nick Wright. Now, how many people out here have a phone, an iPhone, that's over four years old? All right, more than I thought. The reason I bring that up is that we get rid of our iPhones every so many years, that Apple product, but the Apple product that we, that we use to put content on the web is over a third of a century old. Think about that. And I bring this up because scary things happen when you let your users play with dinosaurs. <laughs> um, or you could just say, users find a way. <laughs> Remember, we're designing things, we're using an interface that was designed for print, and now we want interactive things, and so we have something like this. What is that? Short code. Short code. Yeah, short code. Um, which is very, very user friendly. And so some of the scary things that happen, some of the horrors of, of users dealing with bad authoring interfaces, are that you get those help desk calls that, you know, Brian's lightning talk mentioned. So people forget how to update things, or people break the short codes. I worked a lot in CK Editor, which by the way used to be called FCK Editor. They dropped the F, and I did lots of times trying to make that thing work for my users. <laughs> um, because what would happen is somebody would delete a closing tag. Uh, we tried to use progressive enhancement to create things like accordions. We used their templates feature. And it was all great until somebody went in and accidentally deleted some code. And when that becomes really frustrating to a user and they're very scared, and these are people who maybe the web isn't their first job, they might see this as a chore, and it is. And so they might let content die. Now in any great horror movie, it doesn't just end with the content dying. You always get a couple of really resourceful people that hole um, that up in a mall and get really creative about the weapons that they make and the, the food and the shelter. And to me, that's like the users who know enough HTML to be dangerous. Those are the people who give you face meltingly awful content. <laughs> they get in there and they decide that they're going to design everything for the width of their screen. They do things that aren't necessarily accessible. They have tables within tables within tables that are layouts. They add scripts that they might have gotten from somewhere or styles that have gotten from somewhere. And eventually, they create pieces that are not responsive, not accessible, and they make your eyes bleed or your face melt off. Which goes to show that you could have the most accessible template out there, and it's not accessible if your users are dumping their garbage in there. I've been on some garbage cleanup. Um, I have a friend who likes to dump things in these bins. And, and so I do a lot of divvy dumpster diving for a friend of mine. And I know that we need a new block editor. Problem is, what we're asking our users to do is we're asking them to be accessibility specialists with the WYSIWYG. We're asking them to be good visual designers, and we're asking them to be developers. And typically, we're asking staff assistants as their other duties is assigned. 
And it just seems crazy that we're asking our users to do these things. When there are newer, younger authoring experiences that allow anyone to be a content author without having to know HTML. So now I use a block editor and block editors are cool. We can innovate. Let's do something new. So this is the new thing that we've done. For better or for worse. And I think a good authoring experience will make content creation easier for authors. But I also think that it should do so for all authors. Sometimes critics argue that accessibility is too hard, that it's holding back progress, that you can't do something accessible and cool and innovative at the same time. And to me, you're not really getting anywhere if you're throwing users under the bus to get there. We're not innovating. The block editor is not new. I took you down this trip to memory lane because we've done block editors before. We've also done them in Weebly. Shout out to Penn State, by the way. These are Penn Staters that created Weebly. Uh, we've done it with Wix in 2006. Hey, that rhymes. Uh, one year younger than my son. And we've done it in Squarespace, again. 15 years. This is an innovation because it's been around for 15 years. But there's another definition for innovation. And that is that we find better solutions and meet new unarticulated needs. I work in ed tech and I can tell you from my years in ed tech and my years in teaching, there are a lot of ed tech tools out there and they usually fall in two buckets. There are the ed tech tools that do really, really, really cool things and the ed tech tools that are accessible. It's really rare to find one that does both. And to me, that's the unmet need. That's the innovation. Anybody can make a really cool ed tech tool. Anybody can make an, ex well, lots of people can make accessible ed tech tools. But if those skill sets were combined, that to me is where the magic happens. As a multimedia person, I hated being the, ball, uh, the bottleneck for creating interactive content. And the programmer in me said, we need to create something that allows that to scale to everyday users. As a technology trainer, I knew that um, mitigating errors and simplifying interfaces would go a long way to making things better, would be innovative. Or in working with an accessibility specialist, I wanted that authoring interface and the content it produced to be accessible without people being accessibility experts. That's innovation. That's meeting an unarticulated need, a better solution that somebody hasn't come up with. And so the unicorn that I really want is not to make our other duties as assigned people have all of these aspects about themselves. But I want us to innovate around making sure our block editors are user friendly, that they're accessible, and that they help people create accessible content. So in the work that I've been doing, one of those examples is our Alley Media Player. Again, there are a lot of video players out there, and there are accessible players. And often, the innovative ones aren't accessible, and the accessible ones do not meet the design standards of the people who are really pushing to leave accessibility behind. And so, Throughout the past year, I've been working on this player. What we have is a player with buttons that can use keyboard shortcuts. It has a caption and transcript toggle button. The transcript is interactive. You can click on the transcript to jump to a point. You can search it. You can stop it from scrolling automatically if that's distracting. Um, we do have the ability to print, and you can get the printed transcript. And on top of that, when we, had, um, when we had users with visual impairments test it, they said, the print one is really hard for us to pull up. What would be more useful is if I could download the transcript. And so the latest release of that, we added a download button. And to me, I felt like I, I could make a player, but everybody's made a player. And this did take months and months of my life. But it was, it was great to be able to do something that not a lot of people have done. And that, that to me is the heart of innovation. I believe that every user or content author 
should have a place at the table, that we're not throwing people under the Lego bus to get to where we need to get, because they are part of the, the audience that we're trying to take to that de destination, especially in higher ed. And speaking of tables, how many of you have found a good solution out there for editing tables? Anybody? Um, I, have, I have heard people tell users, just don't add tables in web content. They just don't work. Either because it's too hard for them to learn how to make an accessible table, or they're just not going to be able to make a responsive table. And there's an unmet need. So one of the other projects I'm in the middle of working on is actually an accessible table editor. Let me show you. So this is, of course, a tiny MCE table editor. And I'm looking for all the places where I could put a summary. Um, where do I say something's a header? How do I do striping? You have to be an expert to be able to use it. What we're trying to do with editable table is make a table editing interface for a block editor which, by the way, is not just tied to hacks. It could be integrated in any other project, and I'll get to why shortly. So second shameless plug of three, I'm actually going to present on that table editor in more detail at High Ed Web in Milwaukee. Uh, when I did this table, I believe that content authors shouldn't have to be accessibility experts. So what we have is we have a table, and when they toggle the edit, They'll be able to use it in the same way that they would a spreadsheet, but they're not going to be able to merge cells because we don't want to make the merging of cells confusing. And then there's a, there's a spot for a summary, a spot for the table caption. And if we go into the settings, and I'm going to zoom in here, um, they will be able to specify which sections are headers and footers and it will mark up the table accordingly. Additionally, we don't think that content authors should have to be visual design experts. So one of the other pieces that we've been working on in the table editor is, and across our hacks ecosystem, is the idea of being able to theme things, allow people to pick an accent color, but determining what combinations of colors are still accessible. So they select from a list of accent colors, it picks the right shade, and there's even a dark mode. And they can adjust their table, edit it, make it colorful without having to mess things up. They also can select border, striping, condensed mode, bless you. Um, and I don't think that they should have to be responsive web experts. So it's automatically responsive. And it gives two columns at a certain uh, breakpoint. And this breakpoint is relative to the parent container, not the window, because sometimes people have things and items in columns within columns within columns. Uh, same with the video player. It's also um, responsive to the parent container. And this will show two columns at a certain breakpoint. They can then select the column from a dropdown. And finally, I don't think content authors should be developer experts. So sorting and filtering are things that they can toggle on the table editor as well. Um, and I lied about finally. How many of you have institutions that use more than one CMS? Do any of you also have authors that work across both? Some. So this gets to the, the big question, or the big statement, and that is, I don't think content authors need to be CMS experts, right? Content authors have too many authoring experiences. Bless you. you now, we mentioned, I deliberately mentioned that content authoring is really about the relationship that the content author has with the authoring interface. That's what the heart of authoring experience is that relationship. So why is our CMS coupled with our authoring interface. So what we're doing with our hacks project is we're actually decoupling the block editor from the CMS. You know, if only there was a block editor that worked on any platform. Any content management system, any JavaScript library or framework that happens to be in your tool belt or your bat cave, 
any visitor or content author. And so our big project, HACS, is what we're trying to do to address that. So HACS stands for Headless Authoring Experience. And if you're wondering where the headless comes from, typically people refer to headless as the idea that you're separating your front end from your back end, maybe because you have multiple ways of delivering the same content that's stored in your back end. It could also be to facilitate migrating your back ends. And in our case, uh, part of the reason was for that purpose, to go from Drupal 7 to 8 seamlessly. Um, because all of you are Coke people and currently I live in a Pepsi world. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're trying to migrate. And, um, and as we were migrating the front end, they realized, well, why wouldn't you just do that with the authoring interface as well? So we decoupled that, that authoring interface, which is now called Hacks, which is separate from our, our content system. And just for shits and giggles, we decided to test our hypothesis and we wrote modules and plugins to have it work in Drupal 6, 7, 8, WordPress, Grav, back, Backdrop, and then we said, well, why not make our own lightweight CMS, a static file generator, think Dreamweaver, but as a block editor. And so we made a hack CMS. Now, the, um, the same authoring experience works across all the CMSs. And I didn't trust myself the live demo, so what you're going to get, and I have to navigate to a different screen, so bear with me here. Hello, other screen, I can't see you. Let's try this. Ah. I'm over there. Oh. I did it in front of a live audience. Also, there's this. I should probably start that over. Maybe there's sound by any chance for this? Nope. It's just me talking through it. So are you ready? Ready. So here we are playing with a prototype of hacks within WordPress. Um, it actually even has a content type called meme, and you can see that there. We've got regular text content, and below that we have a video. You can see that video. Um, then we scroll back up just so that you can see it all again. Um, now we're going to go ahead and Go into source view, copy to clipboard. I'm going to drop that same content into Drupal 7. Update the body area. Same content, same features in Drupal 7. We're going to repeat this a couple times. Drupal 8. How many of you had migrations that easily between versions of things? <laughs> Drupal 8. What the heck, let's do it in backdrop. How about grab? Same content. And then just in our own little proprietary hack CMS. All right. So now I have to migrate away from this with my mouse. <laughs> It's 
So we're able to pull that content out of one CMS entirely to another very easily. Now that's just on the page level. Our goal is to be able to migrate content en masse that way. Um, the other thing is maybe you want to take it offline because then they don't have access to a database. So maybe you are talking static site generation because it's content that doesn't need to be updated a lot or maybe by one person. So part of the reason we did hack CMS was the idea that a lot of websites are those little one-offs that probably would have been best served by Dreamweaver. And so hack CMS um, serves that purpose so that they don't actually need a, a full database behind it. You could actually download that full file and it would work without any CMS behind it. And why does this happen? Why does this work really well? That's all through the magic of web components. Um, how many of you are actually familiar with what web components are? A couple? Some? Maybe now more than a couple. Um, so web components are based on four browser specifications. The first one is HTML templates. Templates, we get that. We all work within templates of some sort. I find that template's a very generic word that means different things to all people. It's a content template. It's a, it's a site template. But yeah, HTML templates. There's also the ability to define custom elements, and that means you're creating your own very your own tag your own tags that have their own naming convention. That makes it a lot nicer to read than div soup. Um, there's Shadow DOM, and that allows us to scope the styling. So part of the reason it was so easy to migrate things from site to site is that some of the styles are self-contained within Shadow DOM. And we can use variables to change those to make them theme specific. So if we had a different accent color or whatever, that would switch on the fly because we had some variables. But it allows us to kind of lock those styles down and make migration easier. And then there's ES modules. And ES modules allows you to import other web components until you're stacking on top of each other like blocks and building. So you can start from something as small as a web component button. And the next thing you know, you have a dashboard, or you have a series of fields and buttons. And then the next thing you know, you've built an entire um, content management system and an entire block editor out of nothing but web components. Web components all the way down. And the reason why these are my favorite over any of the new things that we're playing with on the web is because they are a browser standard, and they're becoming, in all of the major browsers, something that's supported natively. And uh, by next year, we should be fully covered. So they are used by Google. Why do I feel like I lost my connection? I have lost my connection. It's going to take me back to the beginning. Bear with me.
the video of Gilbert. Okay, so web components are used by Google, and if you ever view source on YouTube, you're going to see a lot of YTD dash whatever. Those are the YouTube specific web components that they're using. Here's a better view of them. So you don't get the div soup. Instead, they're defining these components um, individually and then using them together. Um, it, it feels more semantic to me to have these tags. They're also used in EA. And those are great examples of industry. But you might be wondering, what about higher ed, since we are higher ed folks? So a great example of web components in action is BYU. Um, how many of you don't control all of your CMSs, all of your sites, and all of your templates? OK. Which is probably a branding nightmare, I would guess. Uh, so what they're doing at BYU is they've actually created this CDN site for all of the web components that they wanted to standardize around. For example, they, get a, they have a getting started page, and it tells you where the script is that links to the web components, which is the first step. Very similar to, say, um, using Bootstrap, right? You have a script you include. And then they give examples. So if you want to use this header that has a link menu, they give you the code necessary to do that. And again, it's, it's very semantic. Theirs are all prefixed with BYU. They can do a header with a search. And again, all the search functionality is taken care of. They just include the search. Um, they have a user login. So that interface doesn't have to be recreated across all of the different university systems. How many of you have university systems where the login to the interface is like different each system you're in? <coughs> yeah, that never happens. I, Silos upon silos upon silos. And, and something like this that they can share among their web people is the silo breaker. Um, and then the footer, having the official footer. But I, when I really go back to the header, um, you know, Penn State changed its logo slightly a few years back. And you can imagine that there are tons and tons of websites across Penn State <laughs> And they all had to go change that logo. The beauty of the CDN and using web components is that they could just change it on the CDN side, and immediately all of those components would have the updated piece. So that's why we decided to do it that way with Hacks. Hacks itself is a single web component. And because it's built on these browser specifications, you can use it with anything in your, uh, in your tool belt. So that this is, ha you know, hacks might have a hacks body tag, and then all the other components it uses are within that. Hacks could then be used, you know, in a shop that's React. Hacks could be used with Angular. Hacks could be used with Vue. It doesn't matter what your framework is because it's you can use it anywhere you use HTML. And because Hacks itself is built on all of these web components, pieces like that table editor that I showed you, the media player, there's a gallery because everybody needs to have a gallery on their site, and even simple form fields that are generated from a JSON file. Any of those components can be used in other systems. So even if you don't choose to use Hacks, you could actually use one of the components that we've created today. I'm not asking that everybody abandon Gutenberg for this crazy idea that we've had. Um, but I am saying, you know, if you're interested, if you want to contribute, if you want to try, because we, we aren't WordPress people in my current office. So 
we only did the plug-in for shits and giggles, but we would love to have somebody interested enough in this project to, to help maintain that plug-in. Or if you're not interested in the hacks part at all, that's fine too. Let's talk about web components and how we can share them. Because it doesn't matter what technology you're using or what I'm using, we could still share parts of our ecosystem. And to me, I, I think this is great. This is the heart of open source being able to share these. Um, you could go on web components or now and see all of the different web components that are available to you. Pieces like uh, the VOD and upload. So if you needed a good file upload interface, why recreate that? A Monaco code editor. We, our team created LRN Math which is a MathJax piece. If MathJax changes or you don't want to use MathJax, we only need to change it at the component level. And if you had a CDN, you would only need to update the newest version of the component. And anywhere they're using that math would be instantly updated. In fact, we're doing that. Uh, our College of Science, who's also part of this project, recently made the move to use LRN and math before they made the move to hacks. Simple fields. And of course, I'm gonna give you a plug in on top of that. And that is, if you really are interested in getting it uh, started with web components, we are doing an academy at High Ed Web. Um, it's, a, it's a separate uh, event before the event. And it's an intro to web components piece to get you started, figure out how you can import those into your own projects, how you can build on them. Uh, the future is you. It's time, you know, you want to do time travel with us and move into the future. Join us at hackstheweb.org. Help us build this space. And the eval link's here. I will entertain some questions. Now I'm worried. Yes, Paul. What about long-term support? Is this a project? What does long term support look like for this So that is a really good question because I will say we are a very small team. And um, so the person who really started this project is still supporting his Drupal module LMS and has been for the past X number of years. Yes, it would be better if we had more than one maintainer. And um, we're hoping that other people are interested, but we're, you know, long term, as long as we're all in higher ed and most of us have no plans on going anywhere else, this is how we're going to run things for the foreseeable future. And then you mentioned how many users do you have using? So by users, do you mean the students who see the content, by content authors, or the developer? Um, we are basically the people who are working on the hacks project are two colleges within the university instead of the whole university. So the science course, online courses are currently using it and the College of Arts and Architecture courses are using it. So that's up and running. Um, so we're talking about the instructional design teams on both sides. Um, I would say there's probably about five core authors on each end, and then we have our developer team, which is very small. But the beauty of web components and being able to leverage that work is I've, we've been able to work faster than any development I've ever done before. And then as far as students go, um, World Campus is actually Penn State's largest campus aside from the main one, and those are two colleges that offer a number of online courses. And we have a group that we work with on an ongoing basis to periodically reevaluate the accessibility of those pieces as well. And that's, that's the for high ed by higher ed is accessibility has to be a priority to us. Also because we were sued. <laughs> so, uh, so for us, we have, to, we have to keep up with this for the foreseeable future to make sure that we have accessibility in our hands. So um, you talked about hacks as an alternative to other blog editors, other Gutenberg, and the other ones you put on the thing. 
Would you go out on a limb to describe how PAX is a better authoring experience than some of those other tools? So I think the big part is the decoupling, being able to use it across systems. The other piece is that the content it's actually authoring is actually authoring web components. Uh, there are pieces of it that, uh, since we're talking about instructional content and educators are the biggest reusers of content you can find, there are pieces of the authoring where you can do a block that is basically searching for third-party resources and inserting them. So we have a NASA API, and one of the things you can add as one of your blocks is content from NASA or content from Wikipedia or somebody's code pen or somebody's sketch fab. So one area where it distinguishes itself is it's extensible. And because it's all on web components, you could eventually take all of that completely offline or migrate it, and it would all still work. Let's put you on the spot. Can you demonstrate Yeah, I can. Let me try to make technology work here. Let's see here. Yeah. All right, so yeah, one of my videos that was actually demonstrating it was not loading for me, so we will do this live. So this is the uh, Hacks Editor, or the, the HacksTheWeb.org site is actually built on Hacks CMS. And now we're in edit mode. <laughs> I accidentally got into my slides. Let's try driving again. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to edit, bold, italic. I want to move this up. Here's my video player. I want to change my accent color. I can set a thumbnail image if I want. Date. And there should be a ah, animated uh, image. image. If we go into search, I am going to choose a Wikipedia article, search on web components, pull in an article, update. Now the article is inserted. Maybe I want to find a spaceship. Uh, I don't see spaceships, but we'll just insert this piece. It says it's an image. How would you like to display the image? Do you want to make a gallery, a full width image, a hero image, a self check question? I'm just going to pull it in as a hero image. It's pulled in the metadata. And if I update, I have a hero image. Pretty awesome. Oh. Uh, all right, Nikki, where is the demo located? That is hackstheweb.org. You okay. can actually play, do a live edit, and it will give you information on how to get started. Great with stuff. Hacks. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki, very yeah. much. Great. <laughs> awesome.